everybody. Good evening and happy Sabbath. Welcome to the continuation of our launch of UNIT, You and I Together. It's an initiative. We hope you have been blessed by what took place this morning. This afternoon, we will show you practical steps in making UNIT possible. We want to see greater involvement, partnership, and growth among our church members and in a special way between our youth and senior leadership. It's time to close this generation gap. So if you haven't had a chance to view this morning's program, please take the time to look it up on our East Caribbean Conference YouTube page. And now that you're with us, let's prepare to enter a special session on how we can make the best of unit. Before we go any further, Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here on your holy Sabbath day. We pray as we look at this initiative that you may help us to see how we can work together as a team for the faith. Help us to be about the powers of darkness and allow unity to prevail so that your work may go forward until you are ready to usher in your kingdom. In just name we pray, amen. Now, we invite you to join us in singing as we are led into songs of praise. The splendor of a king. The splendor of a king. Holy majesty. Love in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself, he wraps himself in light, and darkness try to hide, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles, and trembles at his voice, and trembles, and trembles at his voice. Shouts! 
to us this afternoon for our devotion is our own president, Pastor R. Danford Francis. He is no stranger to us, and so we welcome him as he sets the spiritual tone for this evening's AY session. It is with great delight that I bring you the family of the East Caribbean Conference, the devotional thought for the launch of this new initiative, UNIT, you and I together. It is our desire to initiate an intentional way of life, which meets the fulfillment of the prophecy made in Malachi 4, 6, which reads as follows. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The vision predicts the release of the creative passions, skills, and zeal of the youth circumscribed and crossed by the pearls of wisdom of the older generation. Hopefully, the result will be our church becoming an intergenerational militant church and ultimately an intergenerational triumphant church. Mark Twain, the American humorist, journalist, lecturer, and novelist, is reported to have said, and I quote, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished how much the old man had learned in seven years. But then, and in the 19th and 20th century, we see these tensions. Over time, we see growth in both parties. But we can assume that the young man learned the most and experienced a change of perspective, which led to greater appreciation, understanding, and collaboration. Unfortunately, many like Mark Twain seem to think that their parents are not with it. But this view is not new. Perhaps it is a human tendency ever since sin entered the world for people to seek to blame others for their own faults. Didn't Adam blame the woman and God for his fault? That being said, we are not surprised to detect the same tension and disposition between youth and adults in Paul's time. Paul in his instructions to the young Timothy said to him, don't let people look down on, your, on you because you are young. See that they look up to you because you are an example to them in your speech and your behavior, in love and faith and sincerity. This was the Philip's version of 1 Timothy 4, 12. The wording that the Apostle Paul uses suggests that people were in the habit of downplaying the role that youth could play or even more extreme, of devaluing the youth altogether. Paul seems to take it as an undesirable fact, and he counseled Timothy how he could deal with this attitude. Don't be sidetracked by defending yourself, but be an example. An example of the believer. An example is irresistible. Ellen G. White writes, one example is worth more than many precepts. 
Timothy was not to be a signpost pointing the way. Timothy was not just to tell what they should be like. Timothy should demonstrate what he would like the believer to be. Alas, we too in the 21st century are touched by the same tension. As a result, the youth are being robbed of the pearls of wisdom of the adults, if Mark Twain was correct at 14. If Ellen G. White, on the other hand, is correct, the church and the world are being robbed of the talent and the capacity of the youth. She made this remarkable statement. He, Satan, well knows that there is no other class that can do as much good as young men and young women who are consecrated to God. The youth, if right, could sway a mighty influence. Preachers or, or laymen advanced in years cannot have one half the influence upon the youth that youth devoted to God can have upon their associates. They, the youth, ought to feel the responsibility resting upon them to do all they can to save their fellow mortals, even at the sacrifice of their pleasure and natural desires. Time and even means, if required, should be consecrated to God. That was taken from Message to Young People, page 204. But who is responsible to see that these youth are right? Ellen G. White answers that question by saying, those who are older must educate the youth by precept and example to discharge the claims that society and their maker have upon them. Upon these youth must be laid grave responsibilities. The question is, are they capable of governing themselves and standing forth in the purity of their God-given manhood, abhorring everything that savors of wickedness? Councils to Parents and Teachers, page 536. And God affirms that the old and wiser by experience must teach the younger. And he also says it is not a waste of time to teach the youth. 1 John 2, 12 to 14 tells us, I would only read verse 14. I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the world, the wicked one. And so both the fathers and the young people can have a similar relationship with God and they can share what, with one another and do the work that God calls them to do. God who created us knows and understands the theory of retrogenesis. Once a man, twice a child, meaning that we start life as a child, we grow up into adult, and then as we age and lose, we lose ability, both physical and cognitive, we become like children again. With a whole world to influence for Christ, with re retrogenesis in effect, God knows that there needs to be an inflection point where the synergy of both groups become necessary for the task to be completed. And that time is now. Observe the effects of the Elijah message, which we preach. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. If there's one church on the face of the earth that should not have a generation gap, it is ours, the Seventh-day Adventist church. The biblical message is clear. The Elijah message that we preach will bring about that synergy. But somehow, although we preach the message, we are not allowing it to work. And it totally, we don't like to be together. We don't sing or dress the same way. We seldom are attracted to the same things. And rather than seeing this difference or these differences as a positive, we use it as a negative. We seem to forget that it could become a mosaic of beauty. It seems to me that that is what God had in mind and which is expressed by Ellen G. White with such an army of workers as our youth, rightly trained, might furnish. How soon the message of a crucified, risen and soon coming savior might be carried to the world. How soon might the end come, the end of suffering and sorrow and sin. How soon in the place 
of possessions here with its blight of sin and pain. Our children might receive their inheritance where the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Where the inhabitants shall not say, I am sick, and the voice of weeping shall no more be heard. If we want this message to go to the world quickly, if we want the end to come quickly, if we want the end of suffering and sorrow and sin to come quickly, if we want to receive that inheritance soon, there are two things that we must do. The youth must be rightly trained and mentored by rightly trained adults. And, the, and then our youth will be tied to our churches, involved and engaged with the older ones to carry out the gospel to the world. I believe this change is possible and it is necessary. While the church is God's object of supreme regard, it is not perfect. Servants of the Lord says and counsels to the church, the church, enfeebled and defective, needing to be reproved, warned and counseled, is the only object upon the earth which Christ bestows his supreme regard. So God is reproving, he's warning and is counseling his church this evening that change is needed. As the older generation moves off the stage, Ellen G. White queries, with the deepest concern, the question may be asked, who will fill their places? To whom are, the commit, are to be committed the vital interests of the church when the present standard bearers fall? We can look but anxiously upon the youth of today as those who must take these burdens, upon whom the responsibilities must fall. These must take up the work where others leave it. And their course will determine whether morality, religion, and vital godliness will prevail, or whether immorality and infidelity shall corrupt and blight the, all that is valuable. Are we too late? I say God forbid. All his biddings are enablings. God can give us the strength to do all that is necessary. May God help us not to be too stubborn but to change for the better. So the gospel will be taken to the whole world, the whole of ECC, and then Jesus will come. This is what is at stake. The elevation or the deterioration of the future of society will be determined by the manners and morals of our youth growing up around us. As the youth are educated and as their characters are molded and their childhood to very and their childhood to virtuous habits, self-control, and temperance, so will their influence be upon society. If they are left unenlightened and uncontrolled, and as a result become self-willed, intemperate in appetite and passion, so will the future influence, so will be their future influence in molding society. The calm day which the young keep, the habits which they are now form, and the principles they now adopt are the index to the state of society for years to come. Adventist on page 16. If we are to experience the positive outcomes we desire, we must do the following four things. We, the older ones, must make space for the youth to join us as partners in the church. Secondly, begin with loving them unconditionally so we can educate them. Thirdly, we must value them by allowing them to participate in a meaningful way to their age and giftedness. And fourthly and finally, we must release them to use their passion, their zeal, and their strength to do what they can do and what we can no longer do. This church, this Seventh-day Adventist church started with the zeal and passion of the youth. And it will not end in another way, but it will end with the young people playing the more important role, but always as an integrated body. It is my hope that God will bless us as we begin this journey, you and I together, so that the end may come speedily. God bless you. Good day to all. 
My name is Pastor Dean Yearwood of the St. Philip District Number 2 on the island of Barbados. Wherever you are, if it's possible, we will ask you to bow your heads for a moment of prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We, your people, seek forgiveness at this time. We thank you for this opportunity as we feel the weight of our sins lifted from our shoulders. We also thank you for the chance to be a part of yet another service rendered to you on behalf of your congregations in both Dominica and Barbados. We bring before you the islands represented here by the East Caribbean Conference of Seventh-day Adventists with our present challenge being the spread of COVID-19 on each island. We seek your guidance and protection in our going out and in our coming in. Calm our minds, O oh Lord. We also place our relationship before you. And we ask, O oh Father, that as we take a closer look at our relationship of you and I together, unit, we pray that all the youth involved, that all the adults involved, that all the members involved, O oh Father, will indeed listen to your Holy Spirit. Father, you also bring before you the persons who are even now being prepared as they await to receive an invitation, a link, or even a digital flyer in preparation for this upcoming soul saving event. Use us as you see fit as we recommit our lives into your hands. We place this program into your hands for Christ's sake, amen.
In this presentation, I want to discuss why it is important for the Church to orient itself towards the youth and what it means to prioritize youth. We will also look at some practical ways you as a youth leader can help your Church to prioritize youth everywhere. So my first question, why it is important to prioritize youth? Firstly, we follow God's example when we prioritize our youth. In the ancient society, it was not typical to give attention and assign importance to children and young people. But God turned down that tendency on numerous occasions. He often chose younger brothers as objects and agents of His grace. He chose many young people to do extraordinary things for Him. Just remember Joseph, Samuel, David, King Josiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Jesus' mother Mary, Timothy, and many others. The prime example of choosing young people was Jesus. He chose 12 young disciples to train them for world-transforming ministry. Many biblical scholars believe that most of Jesus' disciples were under 20 years old. Jesus trusted them and invested in these young people. The second reason why it is important to prioritize youth is the fact that the youth work is missionary work of the highest kind. I believe that most leaders will agree that mission should be our priority. In that context, it is good to hear strong words by Ellen White. Very much has been lost to the cause of truth by lack of attention to the spiritual needs of the young. Ministers of the gospel should form a happy acquaintance with the youth of our congregations. Many are reluctant to do this, but their neglect is a sin in the sight of heaven. Why should not labor for the youth in our borders be regarded as missionary work of the highest kind? We should never put mission and youth ministry in dichotomy. Youth ministry is a missionary work par excellence. Thirdly, youth are the most receptive and the most open for the gospel. Several empirical studies have shown that more than 80% of all decisions for Jesus are made before the age of 25. This is also true for the decisions for or against the church. The adolescent phase has great significance for future life because it is characterized by serious reflection and formative decision-making. As a church, we should be there to help young people make good and wise life decisions. Finally, our churches will grow young if we prioritize our youth. Our reality is that most of our churches are growing older. 40 to 60 percent of our youth will drift from our faith community once they leave school. At the same time, we are not very successful at reaching unchurched youth. So our churches are aging, and the percentage of young people in our churches is much lower than that in the general population. Well-known research entitled Growing Young asks the question, which qualities are crucial if we want uh, the church to grow young? After analyzing data from many churches that grow young, they identified six core commitments your church needs to grow young. The most crucial commitment is to prioritize young people everywhere. Instead of giving lip service to how much young people matter, we should look for creative ways to tangibly support, resource, and involve them in all facets of our church life. Growing young researchers concluded, regardless of your context, our research has us convinced that the hinge point separating churches that grow old from those who, that grow young is priority. In other words, if we want to grow as a church, if we want our church to have a future, we should orient ourselves toward young people. In that way, we are following Jesus' leading, which is in the long term the most successful mission strategy. My second question in this presentation asks, what does it mean to prioritize the youth? In fact, may I ask you another question? How much would you give up in order to reach young people. If you really prioritize youth, you would do whatever it takes, except change our prophetic message. An experienced pastor once said, if you want to know the priorities of a church, look at their budget and other resources. 
Not only their budget resources, but also personnel, facilities, time, attention, and programming. They should all show that youth are our priority. Good leaders and programs don't automatically lead to priority. It's not only about hiring a youth pastor or choosing a good youth leader or setting aside a room in your church where teenagers can exercise their dominion. Prioritizing young people everywhere means more, much more. When you think about budget, strategy, worship planning, programming, community life, even theology, and all other aspects of church life, you think about young people. You intentionally pay attention everywhere. In order to prioritize our youth, it's very important to prioritize families too. We cannot engage with children and adolescents apart from the systems in which they are rooted, in particular their families. For decades, the practice in youth ministry was otherwise, but now the focus is on families for two reasons. Because parental influence matters the most. Parents have bigger influence than pastors and youth leaders. And also because parents need support, all the support they can get. Finally, to prioritize, to prioritize our youth means to consider them as our main partners. As we said before, God, God used many young people in the Bible for significant tasks. Youth as our orientation is not about churches just taking better care of the youth, but much rather about youth being considered real partners. The youth should be viewed not only as objects of our care, even more importantly, they should be considered as important subjects of church life. Young people should uh, want to take part in forming and developing the life of the church. In this way, the church community keeps moving forward. Ultimately, the church possesses no greater source of potential for advancement than it's found in its youth. The Bible and the history of Christianity are full of examples of how God works together with young people and does exceptional things through them. So young people must play a load-bearing role. They should be involved not only in small, secondary roles, but be asked to take heavy responsibilities. They should become purposeful co-participants in the life of the church, rather than just junior participants or future members. Their voices, hands, and hearts matter now. Lastly, I ask you, what can you, as a youth leader, do to help churches prioritize our youth? I'm sure, sure you, as youth leaders, have a dream of a church that is growing young, not old, that is successful in retaining its youth and in attracting unchurched youth. But when we want to achieve that, we usually focus either on trying to find a new, better program, or we are focusing on helping youth ministry leaders to work better. I believe that solution isn't to focus just on better programs or on helping youth leaders. We should be aware that the youth ministry is usually like one-ear Mickey Mouse, attached to the church, but not integrated to the church. By helping only youth leaders, we are not helping the church orient itself towards the youth. Therefore, in order to help the church prioritize youth, we should first work on changing the congregational culture. Growing young researchers have rightly noticed that to prioritize youth means steady commitment that becomes a lifestyle of the entire church. But this doesn't happen just by good leaders or in great youth programs. Most important is the congregational culture, and that is much deeper than programs. It's about the church attitude and attributes. It's about the value system. Culture change means building an overall ethos of investment in youth. In this context, I would like to recommend to you the i or Church of Refuge Initiative, as a good tool to work on changing the congregational culture. ICOR is based on several basic principles. First, family of God as the leading metaphor for the church. Secondly, an inclusive approach that welcomes all generations and cultures. Thirdly, youth as important partners of the church. ICOR has developed many useful resources, a study guide, short video clips, a church board guide, and many more. 
These resources are designed to help you, local church leaders, change your local church culture by discussing and implementing biblical values with everybody in your church. i isn't another program. It deals with the value system, what we are supposed to be, not only what we do. It deals with the entire church. It helps pastors, elders, and other local church leaders prioritize their youth. So my first practical suggestion is work on changing the congregational culture. Secondly, rethink the numbers. Consider evaluating the following numbers and see what picture emerges. Think about the ratio of young people in your community versus the ratio of young people in your local church. What percentage of your budget is currently allocated toward youth ministry programs? What percentage of the best staff is involved in the ministry to youth? Percentage of young people on stage? How many young people are preaching and having other significant responsibilities in the church? If we are really prioritizing our young people, this number should show that good intentions are not enough. Your intentions to prioritize youth should be intentionally put in action, and that will be visible in your numbers. The third suggestion, assess everywhere. Make a list of all current ministries in the church, analyze them, and see how many young people are prioritized in each ministry. The first question for every department leader should be, what will the young people do? How can we prioritize the youth in our department? This attitude should be present continually, not occasionally, not from time to time, but every week in everything what we do. Furthermore, when any new program begins, ask a simple question. How can young people be part of this? How is this appealing to our youth? Try to ask the youth what they think about that question and accommodate to their needs. My last practical suggestion Involve the best leaders in working with youth. Encourage your best elders and other leaders to invest their time ministering to the youth. This leader should be focused on mission. And remember, working with your youth is missionary work of the highest kind. It will help your church to grow young.
Good evening and happy Sabbath, everyone. It is so good to be with you today on another Sabbath where we can discuss um, an aspect of you and I together, unit with you. Um, with me, we have a very distinguished panel of individuals who um, reviewed the video that we just looked at and are ready and able to discuss with us aspects of intergenerational ministry or as I like to call it, IG ministry. It's not just Instagram, it's intergenerational. And so I will give them freedom to introduce themselves. Um, we will begin with Pastor Jason Peters. Pastor Peters, please introduce yourself. Good evening, good afternoon, everybody. I am Pastor Jason Peters, uh, originally from Dominica, only from Dominica. I uh, reside in Barbados, working in Barbados. Uh, and I'm happy to be here this evening. Thank you very much, Pastor Peters. Next, we will take Shanae Beckles. Happy Sabbath. My name is Shanae Beckles, as was mentioned before. I am a member of Mount Zion, Seventh day Adventist Church here in Barbados, and I like cucumbers. Nice, 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 nice. And lastly, we have Sister Zara Tusen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. After then, you already called my name. <laughs> my name is Zara Tusa. I am from Dominica. And I love playing the violin. Ah, nice, 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 nice. Might I add, Zara is an excellent violin player. You should listen to her sometime. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, as you know, I am Pastor Denny, um, Youth Director for our conference, and I'm happy to be on this panel this evening. And I'm excited about UNIT, you and I together. As we learned um, this morning, um, UNIT is all about collaboration, partnership, and fostering relationships um, among all members, but especially between the youths and the adults. And one way to foster this is through intergenerational ministry. Um, we would have just looked at a video and we are here to discuss it. And so the first question I want to ask or throw to the panel is how can intergenerational ministry be of great benefit to pastors, leaders, and youth of a local church? Um, I must add that all three of us, well, all of us as panelists have served as youth leaders in one way or the other at our local church. So we can answer this question at least um, two out of three ways since uh, all of us have been youth and all of us have been leaders, just two of us are pastors. So Pastor Peters, I hand over to you first. Um, how do you think intergenerational ministry can benefit pastors at least? Well, first of all, uh, the IG ministry, the intergenerational ministry is, some people might think of it as a concept being presented uh, by church leaders or, or by the GC or whoever came up with the idea. But the truth is, it's a biblical concept. It's the way that the Bible has designed for ministry to happen. Uh, the, the, the passing on of values, biblical values, Christian values and norms from one generation to another. That's intergenerational ministry. And so... It, it doesn't just benefit me as the pastor, it benefits the church. It, it says to me as the pastor that um, that which I am working towards is not just for the now, but for the hereafter, the, the years to come here on earth and the hereafter in, in God's eternal kingdom when he comes. So it, it, is, it, is, it is the work, it is the ministry that God has called us as pastors to do. It is that which we are supposed to be doing. Agreed, agreed, agreed. I can, I can also say, um, as, as a pastor, um, working with young people, working with youth, is a great joy. It gives, it gives a pastor renewed energy and renewed focus. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and seeing values and, and principles being passed on um, doesn't necessarily leave a sense of pride, but a sense of hope that what you are doing is having an impact and um, at least from a pastoral perspective that speaks volumes um, i throw it out um, to shanae or zara any of you can go ahead um, 
what benefit do you see intergener intergenerational ministry having for us as leaders and even for youth um, in, in terms of benefiting from intergenerational ministry? My Shane, you muted. <laughs> yes, and I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> Thank you for the help. <laughs> and that, that's essentially it. Um, I, I have heard someone say the next level is a person, right? And what that tells me, right, is when you are connected with other individuals, it gives you an opportunity for growth. That's how God made the body, um, the body of Christ, the church, so that we are there to help each other. Each individual has a special gifting, and it doesn't matter what age you are. You can be old or you can be young. You have value. And um, intergenerational ministry basically says that you have value. What you have to offer is important. You belong in this community. And that can be in the local church. That can be otherwise. And, and, and it is really highlighted when persons come together doing service projects, like missionary projects, going out and helping other persons. It is really highlighted then. And I also like the fact that um, with it, you get the mentorship from the older ones and you have the passion and the enthusiasm from the younger ones. And even if you um, would have thought, have a certain um, line of thinking or mindset, the influence is there both ways for it to be um, 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 changed, if it needs to be changed, by the two generations or the generations coming together and, and learning about each other. So who does not benefit from good community? Collaboration and as persons come together to do um, service together, one goal, one mission, one project, is, is everybody benefits. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you, Shanae. Um, Zara, all yours, all yours. Shanae said everything I was going to say. <laughs> everything. You can add uh, to I took my notes so that I don't forget my points. Um, we learn from each other. We all think differently the way um, an older folk might think. It was in not the same way I would be. The way I would plan my program is not the same way that person will plan their program. Um, so if we just all work together, you give your inputs and I probably edit it up so that it can be more interesting for the younger ones. Um, I think intergenerational ministry will boost up to be more united. If a church is divided, then the pastor or the members might not even be in the mood to come to church, you might have no taste to come to church because probably every time you come to church, you have to tend to this issue and that issue. So if we all unite it, then you have more taste, taste to want to come to church, want to be part of church. So yes, I think it's very important. Nice, nice, nice. I love I love the different perspectives and and and, and collaboration of thoughts. Uh, we are we are living the benefits of IG ministry. Um, so we looked at it. Oh yes. So we looked at the at the benefits, um, but benefits don't come without um, responsibility or action. So um, one of the things you can ask is, what can either youth or adults do to um, help make intergenerational ministry possible? Um, let's start with the youth this time. What what part can youth play? in making intergenerational ministry a reality. Uh, the floor is open to anyone who ever feels ready can, can start. I saw a question online. It said, um, do sermons effectively engage all generations? Mm. And I said, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> if it is, if it, if it is, we have to. <laughs> We have to remember, we have to remember in a congregation, it's filled with all ages, babies, the toddlers, the older children, high schoolers, youth, elderly, all ages. 
And for me, every Sabbath, I have two little children coming to church with me. And they feel into sleep. Sometimes they want to sleep. And I have to be like, I try to encourage them to, when they are at church, they have to stay up. They have to listen. But if you as the leaders not making that sermon or that um, presentation interesting for even a five-year-old, then they will fall asleep. And can I really blame them? Because sometimes even me, 19-year-old, want to sleep too. So a way the youth can participate is by being part of the sermon. So, so I know sometimes the leaders would ask the youth and they would turn it down. But I still don't think we should just give up on them when they say no. We should still be at them and encourage the youth to be part of the sermon. Because when they are part of the sermon, then at least they can scoop down to the younger people level and even the children level. And probably they could even ask their other peers to contribute to their sermon. So that way, and trust me, those older people, they love when you take it up, you know. They just have more fun than when it's the older people that start preaching. So. So, so you're suggesting one way could be that the youth would have more opportunities to speak, to preach? Yes. Oh, nice, nice. I'm not only preaching, but just being part of the, of the proceedings in general. Okay, so them being more engaged in, in participating in the, in the actual service. That, that, sound, that sounds good. I, I like that one. And, and, and I can appreciate the point of someone's not reaching everybody. Pastor Peter's, that one, that one, hit, that one hit me in the chest. But, yeah. but I used to your chest, I agree. <laughs> oh, <laughs> your whole chest, yeah. And it's oh true. We have to think of different ways to reach our our audiences. It can't be the same thing every time, which is true. Um, Shanae, I guess you want to contribute? Yes, I was I was um, thinking about it in terms of how churches how churches run. You, you usually think about church in worship service on Sabbath and to me, I see that the, just, I'm a teacher and in the classroom is not where I mainly build the relationships. It's outside of the classroom, like on the corridor when I see the children shout and stuff like that. And I'm thinking the same thing happened um, outside of the worship service because everybody's supposed to be focusing on if there's um, praise and worship you sing along or if there's a sermon you listen to intently but the a bit, um, the time for the interaction like when persons have conversation and stuff like that that doesn't really happen in that main divine worship service it happens some of it in the Sabbath school some of it happens after Sabbath school. Some of it happens during the week. And even when you're involved in um, service projects together. And what helps um, the, the bridge the gap is committees. <laughs> when you have to put a program together and you have cooperation between the elders and the youth and the children, it, it fosters that uh, um, collaboration. What I especially like to see is when um, the adults take the time to train the young ones to say a scripture from memory or and uh, that can even be the, the youth doing this. When the youth or adult trains a child to learn a particular passage of scripture and say it from memory, they are being involved in service and they are also having an opportunity outside of service to interact with and talk with and get to know that child. The same thing goes for um, um, adults. I, I was thinking about the transition that youth make from the Sabbath school youth class to that adult class. You know, that's a very serious transition. That, that is like a culture shock. You know, going from, from the school to the adult class is like black and white, two different. <laughs> and then it, 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 you may not be familiar with the people in the class, one. The material that you're looking at is like black and white. And then it's the connection is not there. So what I can say with that, rather than have the youth come out of their community, why not take the teacher, the people, and everybody together and have a, 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 
a summer school lesson that is the adult lesson, but with, 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 with the same community. Basically, you change one factor, not all, <laughs> one time. Not all one time. And that's what um, Pastor, what the inverse was doing there. They had uh, pastors involved, young people involved, children involved, all coming together in one community and discussing things that were important to both of the um, persons involved. So I think that it, it, it does take some measure of intentionality on both the adults and the youth and children coming together to, to make um, um, that coming together intentional. And it can happen when persons are engaged in service projects together. And when you have committees forming together, you have to brainstorm and work together. And that builds or um, bridges the gap. Nice, 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 nice. I appreciate it. Amen. Amen. For both adults and youth. So that was, that was well done. So I, I caught from you um, working together in committees. So, and that would involve some level of communication and, and collaboration. I also saw from the adult perspective to the youth, uh, not just not having too dramatic of a change, but gradual changes, for example, from youth to adult lesson study. And I imagine even from, let's say, Pathfinder to AY as well, that, that can be one. And then also working together in um, mission projects, community projects those can bring um, collaboration between youth and adults. Very good. Um, thank you. Uh, Pastor Peters, over to you. I, I, I want to begin by, by paying attention to what um, Shane said, that um, the IG ministry, the inter intergenerational ministry is not about intergenerational church service, or it is not just about that, because the intergenerational fellowship and, and the impact, the impact that one generation has, is supposed to have on the other generation, the impact that the older generation is to have on the younger generation does not necessarily have to take place within the confines of a church worship service. Yes. And many times we forget that. Many times we forget the importance of, of social gatherings. We forget the importance of just hanging out. We forget the importance of just having fun as an intergenerational intentional event mm -hmm. and much more can take place in terms of passing on the values and the norms of christianity and the church from one generation to the next outside of the walls of the church worship event and i like i like that i like that and we need to pay attention to that if we only hang out when it's time for church service we miss a lot and we don't have to go too far to realize that COVID-19 is pointing that out to us in a very dramatic way. Yep. There is the importance of fellowship and hanging out together uh, among the generations. And that's very important. What I want to say is this. Uh, many times we talk about this subject, um, but we forget that there are structures that, that, need to take, that need to be put in place to have those things become a reality. We cannot just keep talking about subjects like this. We have to make it happen. And making it happen means that we have to either break down some structures that we have, do away with some structures that we have, and build up some new ones. We need to brainstorm, we need to think about those things. And when we find the right thing to do, ensure that we make it happen. As we, as we, as we put our money where our mouth is, mm -hmm as we put value, and, and the value that we're talking about here right now is the value of all young people. Yeah. We, have to, we have to make it happen. And we and have Pastor, to show. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Pastor, you are so correct. And what coronavirus and COVID-19 did is it eliminated that structure. I mean, it was completely gone. And what was essential and important had to come to the forefront in this um, in this environment and and the same things that was seen before that collaboration that community once it was there it was it, it had the opportunity to flourish within this um in this environment and and we saw young persons who have 
um, much to offer as far as the technolo technology is, is coming alongside those in, in, in the, uh, I would dare say, older generation. <laughs> older generation um, doing ministry now together. And I, I, I think that it has exposed and broken down a lot of what is wrong and also allowed for the building of so many ministries. You have seen so many, there are so many young people who through this uh, breaking down of that structure have started a um, very impactful ministry or whose ministries have had the opportunity to flourish during this period of time. I am so thankful, so thankful that they're getting that opportunity and I can see pastors as well are, are, are assisting and, and giving, you know, like putting the weight behind the, these ministries. And the pastor is, is definitely, is definitely, you and I together is definitely happening now, for sure. And, and we, we, we see the good and we're going to make sure that it is continued and, 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 and what is it, emphasized and allowed to flourish, yeah? Nice, nice, nice. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Pastor Peters, you, you had anything else to wrap up? Well, yeah, I, 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 want, I want to emphasize this, and I don't think it can be emphasized enough, that this is not, this is not a new idea. This is, this, is, this is not something that just popped up. This is a biblical principle of how ministry is supposed to happen. We have examples of, of Paul and Timothy. We have Moses and Joshua. These are, these are, these are two groups of persons far apart in, in, age, in age difference. Yet they are working together. Paul has to say to Timothy, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. You are young. And, and we, have, we have all these examples in the Bible of how particularly youth ministry is supposed to be. Back of our minds, some of us believe that youth ministry means young people leading young people. That is not what the Bible has in mind. That is not what God has in mind. Youth ministry is senior, seasoned, matured, spiritually balanced, senior folk leading young people into an encounter with Jesus Christ. Yep. This is what youth ministry is all about. But somewhere along the line, we, 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 we think that uh, youth ministry means putting in the hands of youth, the AY department, young people who themselves are looking for role models, they are looking to, to, to make their way through life, going through puberty, trying to make decisions about their value system and so on. And we, 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 we place them in charge of other young people who are just as confused as they are. And we, and we wonder what happened to the AY department. Well, we went away from the, from the biblical model. The biblical model is the senior youth leading junior youth and helping them to develop to become the leaders that they will later on become. And so this program, you and I together, is actually taking us back to what the Bible says youth ministry should be. And, and I'm, I've, been, I've been saying that we've been saying this for a long time. And we've been begging our seniors, senior youth, our senior adult youth, not to just give up the youth ministries of pathfindering and adventuring and senior youth leadership. They are the ones who lead these younger generations into a relationship with Jesus Christ. So, so this is what it is about. Is is not nothing new. This is what we've been crying out for a long time. So simply and Pastor, and Pastor, I want to say something too. Um, just because we get older does not mean that our spiritual gift is no more. Oh, yeah. It does not mean that. And the reason we can help each other. Yeah. And 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 we are growing together in this body. And if I decide as a young person that I don't need the head, <laughs> then I will definitely be stunting my growth or maturity in Christ. And if the head say I don't need that young person, it is basically saying the same thing. I will be stunting my growth in the body of Christ. And um Oh, this is what I wanted to say. Rather than have in Sabbath school, youth class, being taught by a young person as in a youth. I remember 
um, my youth class was taught by the first elder of the church. And that was impactful. It was very impactful. And uh, when transition is made, because we, we have this thing where we are not only, um, we have ages together for certain um, classes, but the location of them is also like proximity. They're, they're, they're different places. So you don't get the interaction between the very young and the very old. And I think that the actual physical space can be adjusted so that there's such a, a why, why not have one of the adult classes downstairs with the children's class, the child, children's class upstairs with the um, adult class. What I find is when you have that open space and you see other people interacting, it fosters that kind of an environment that um, gives community. So if the children only see children in Sabo school, then changing from children and going out to adults, they're only seeing adults if you're taking away the community they're accustomed to. So it is, mix it up. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate, I appreciate all I was said. And, and for me, if I can add two cents, um, it, it, it boils down to intentionality. Um, we have to want this to happen yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and make it work. And it, and it cannot happen by, it can't occur by happenstance and can't occur by, by um, just letting it flow. We have to be decisive with it. Um, one, of, one of the ways I can see both adults and youth um, making IG ministry happen is to be willing to listen and be listened to. Um, I often tell uh, my youth leaders and especially junior youth leaders, adventurous pathfinders, that it would be sad if your child goes through adventure or pathfinder and then at the end of the year or during summer communion, they testify and say, I want to thank God for helping me graduate this year and you are only now finding out about that i mean i mean there has to be a level of connectedness yeah. with yeah. the youth that you serve so you know what's going on in their lives and 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 you have to be intentional with that and it shouldn't just be a happenstance you check in now and and don't check in again i know when when i was younger sometimes either out of shyness or, or just not feeling to you might see someone you know an elder or whoever, and you might just want to pass another way so you don't get to see them um, and, and avoid the conversation because you don't want to find out their business. But but that time has that, that kind of concept has to change as yeah. well. Um, where we where we can see a member in church and be willing to greet them outside of church. Because the yeah. tendency is to is to connect in that formal space when we're dressed for Sabbath school and 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 we're dressed for for midday and it's present Sabbath, how are you? I'm fine. Praising the Lord, how are you? And I'm trusting and abiding in my Savior. Okay, have a good week. God bless you. And that's it. And we interact with everyone else. Uh, and sometimes based on where we go to school or where we go to work, we don't have that fellowship with other Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, and that, 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 that encouragement, that rubbing together. And then we meet again next Sabbath. But then COVID-19 taught us that, hey, we need to connect outside of church and we need to we need to relate to each other and that has to be something we 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 decidedly act upon so for me um one way i see youth and adults participating is by one being available to connect with each other so it may mean that as an elder as a pastor as a an older member in church you you need to be willing to make your phone number available to your youth sometimes because um, that's where they are on WhatsApp, whatever the case is. It might mean liking their statuses or liking their posts on Instagram once it's positive, of course. And um, it might mean being on Facebook. It might mean posting a status yourself. It might mean changing your picture every now and again, doing something. Yeah, um, yeah. For the youth, it might mean making themselves available to listen when an older person wants to speak to them and wants to connect with them. Don't feel as if they're trying to get in my business. They're trying to find out my, my story and all that. Um, if, if we have to bridge the gap, we have to be willing to listen to 
and be listened to. And I, and I think just that small step can, can, can make a huge difference because for, for me personally, when I, when, when I preach or when I give a presentation and a child says, hey, pastor, um, I like this story you give. Can you do that again? I know that next time I go to that church, I need to come up with another story because it's made an impact for that young person rather than me ignoring it and saying, well, I, I go preach how I want. I go do this how I like. And, and I've lost that connection. I've lost that impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so we have to be willing to listen and be listened to.
that this discussion is so engaging, uh, even forgetting about the time, but we have at least one more question to discuss. And um, we kind of discussed it, but I'm looking at uh, what practical ways uh, or what, what, what principle from intergener intergenerational ministry, especially from the video, even beyond that, can we apply within our local church or in our local sphere? Um, um, I, will, I will just share one off the bat. Um, this, this was one that, that I am proud to say that my mother managed very well as head deaconess in her time. Um, it's sad to say that we can't have it in this aspect now, but it's just a heart back to the past and something we can take the principle and apply. When my mother was head deaconess, she would plan um, picnics, uh, outing days, and it, it, was, it was hosted by the deacons and deaconesses, but it was not limited to that crowd. It was an entire church event. And one of the things they would have, Pastor Peters would know, is, uh, is rounders. Yeah, man, yeah. Was, and it was older versus younger. And, and, and my mother, <laughs> it, it would just be fun to see um, the old ladies who may not be able to run as quickly as the younger ones, able to bowl and bat hard. And it's good to see the younger ones running and trying to dodge the ball and sometimes get a cool bully. But, um, <laughs> but it was nice to see that kind of fellowship. If you went by the river, they would cook together. They would talk together. And, 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 and in those moments, it wasn't, um, how, how do you say? It wasn't formal. There wasn't anything necessarily censured, so to speak, like something you would refrain from saying because it's in church or it's a Sabbath. And you could talk about real issues. You could connect on real topics. You could talk about marriage. You could talk about relationships. You could talk about how we used to have fun in the old days and what we used to avoid doing and what we end up doing and not all kind of story. But it, was, it wasn't something that felt isolated by an age group. It was something where both generations came together and it was natural, it wasn't forced. And, and, and I think um, as, as, as leaders, uh, while we're in a different context so we cannot fellowship physically as much, if we can begin or continue to create avenues and forums for that kind of fellowship and that that doesn't feel like this is a youth thing or this is an adult thing but this is a church thing that everyone can benefit from and work together or even have fun together that's one way i can see intergenerational ministry working in a practical sense that that's that's my contribution um, anyone, anyone else can share that hasn't spoken in a little bit yeah, I was just going to say that. <laughs> I thought of training the youth. Um, I would like to believe the adults are more experienced. So I think you should train the youth. A lot of times, they might just nominate you for a certain office, and then boom, you dare to fight your own battle for yourself. And if probably you don't present it in their style, you might feel judged, they might start to say, but why can't you do that instead of? But if you to encourage me, you to train me, you to show me what to do, tell me what to do. Even if I fix it up in a way that will make it more interesting, but at least I will get that suggestion from you and not be just left to figure it out all by myself. Um, another point. Encouraging the youth, so not just training them, but also encouraging them. I think Pastor Peter mentioned it a while ago. When they have the, when we plan different programs, even AY programs, sometimes you don't really see the older folks. Sometimes you just see young people. I mean, most people think AY is only for the young people. And I hear a lot of people say already, but it's not for Gen Moon. Something like that, they say Gen Moon is for young people, not for the, not for the older folks. So on Sabbath, Sabbath morning, you will see church full, full, full. And then time you come back for a Y, you can count on your two hands how many people are there. So it's not just about not just about um, training, but also encouraging, showing up. Um, also, as Pastor Peter said, it's not just about being confined to a church. Even when we have different all teams, I remember the last time we had a sports day, I think it was during carnival time. 
We had a sports day, and it was fun. We had a tug of war. The females versus the males, males of all ages, females of all ages, and yes. the younger people won. We won. So it's it's all the different programs, all different programs. But one of the main ways I think adults can participate in the intergenerational ministry is by training the youth, encouraging them, and as you said, listening to them and. We, the youth, also should listen to them. Yes, yes, yes. Appreciate it. Go ahead, Shani. Zara, I love what you said. Presence matters. Um, that's both ways. Presence matters. Because we, we like to know what um, this every individual, old or young, likes to know that what I have is valuable to you and you do you show me that you appreciate it by being present and, and encouraging and that's what you were seeing there and that is definitely true um in in for for sure training i can remember i was a person that I would pass people and I speak to them I was so scared so afraid and everything and in a way um it was because an elder at church gave me a messages to young people and made me recite this messages to young people reading it and i shaking in my boots but continuously putting me in that spot to do it become a kid appointment it was like no <laughs> not not afraid as much anymore for that interaction basically so definitely training it it empowers um the young person so um you may be able to see something of value within that individual that they do not see in themselves and one thing for sure is that young I, I, i'm talking about children children have so much energy and passion and love to share, you will never leave that training uh, feeling as though this is hard. This it leave um, in a better place. So definitely training, as Zara would have said, and um, um, I was just thinking, how can we socialize in the virtual context? And that has also occurred during this um, this lockdown period here. The um, socials that would have been planned online. Um, I'm not sure who and what demographic or kind of persons attended, but I like that we have those online online coming together, um, movies, watching the movies together, and even at the form the, the group chats, the group chats together, and these ridiculous memes or gifs. I am not even sure, but because it brings <laughs> laughter and fun. Yeah, so so those are ways no that can be facilitated. But again, it's just about coming together and the um, making yourself available, as you would have said, Pastor, and 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 having a a kind of like accepting our differences. Because off the bat, if you were never um, in a place of communication before, the first thing that we are going to see is you doing that different to me. <laughs> and why are you doing it that way? Not necessarily that that way is a bad way, is definitely the differences come up first if you never was in a community together. And it is, it, it takes um, a spirit of forgiveness, a spirit of accepting others' differences and um, remembering that you're here for one purpose, one mission, one or one thing. And, and, and with that focus, um, doing ministry together, doing life together. Amen. Amen. Uh, Thank you. I want to make reference to, um, I want to go back to a text that was um, referenced earlier, Joel chapter 2, verse 28. The, the Bible speaks of and, and gives us a picture of, of the end-time church. 
where the older generation dream dreams, the younger generation have visions. And, and without going into all the theology of all of that, God paints a picture of the youth and the age working together. The younger generation and the older generation working together towards the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, all the structures that we need are present. All the structures are there. We have not always worked those structures uh, correctly. And I, uh, I would like to believe that the emphasis here is on getting back to those structures and making sure that those structures that are in place, the, 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 the uniform ministries and all those other ministries are, are done in a way that would bring honor and glory to God and lead one generation into the next, the next phase of, of ministry. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter six talks about that. Yep. The older generation teaching the younger generation the laws of God as they walk by the way, as they talk, as they, as they lie together, as they eat together, everything. In other words, in Deuteronomy chapter six, we do not just see church service happening. We see social events, we see educational events, we see emotional and mental and physical, all those different as aspects of Christian growth and human development are spoken of there in Deuteronomy chapter six, from verse one up to verse about six, seven, eight thereabout. So God is saying in every aspect of the Christian's life, this intergenerational aspect is supposed to happen. And I believe sometimes as a church, we need to just sit down and pay attention to that. And if, if at any time we see anything is fallen by the way, pay attention to it. One of the things, Pastor Denny, I started doing uh, as a pastor some years ago, when we have church election, whenever I'm chairing the nomination committee, uh, the first five or six offices that are elected are youth-related. Yeah. Adventurers, Pathfinders, AY, Youth Sabbath School, Children's Ministries ensuring that when, when the nominating committee comes and it is fresh and it is ready to work, we spend time finding the most suitable persons for those ministries. Thanks. Ensuring that we have the best and most qualified persons, both educationally, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, for this. But what I've seen happening is that we elect all the important offices, what we think are the important offices, and by the time everybody's energy is finished, we get to the youth officers and whoever is left, we just chop them there in, in the youth department. This is not right. This is not right. So what I've done over the last 10, 15 years of pastoring, I, I, I flipped the script. We choose the best officers for those tender ministries because we talk about the youth are the next generation and we need, we, therefore we need to give them the best officers to ensure that they move from one stage of the, of, the, of the development, the spiritual, emotional, mental development, and we're giving them the best officers to take them through that transition to ensure that when Jesus comes, that they are present and walking on the sea that looks like glass. Oh, yes. Thank you. Well put, well said. Thank you all for your contributions this evening. Um, I, I don't want the discussion to end, but it appears, <laughs> it appears we will have to for now. Um, but I hope um, for all of you viewing on YouTube that you've been inspired, that you've got some ideas and you can see that intergenerational ministry is possible at your local church level. And I want to extend it even from Pastor Peter's um, reference to um, Deuteronomy 6 to your families as well. Um, intergenerational ministry as well begins at home and what we do as parents with our children can go a big way in bettering our church, bettering our schools, bettering our community, and bettering our future, which is in our hands. And if we participate in unit, you and I together, in a meaningful, intentional way, then we can move to great leaps and bounds. So before we wrap up, I'll just give our panelists um, at least one or two sentences, a final thought. Uh, what's one thing you want to leave with your YouTube viewers as we close this evening's session. Anyone can begin. Like we're waiting on you to call names, Master Day. You're waiting on me to call names? <laughs> Shall we never? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, 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 let's go with Zara. I, li I like to hear Zara. Yes. I like to hear everybody, okay. but I like to hear Zara. <laughs> um, 
let Jesus guide. Let Jesus guide. Um, remember that we all, we are all entitled to our opinions, but at the end of the day, we have to remember the key, and that's Jesus. Let's all work together, young and old, and not be so self-centered, but be other-centered as Jesus would like us to be. I had something to say, but Pastor Danny cut off my question, the last question, so I will take it. <laughs> I, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I, I hush. I hush. Thank you, Zara. You, you spoke eloquently, and I appreciate all your contributions. Thank you. Uh, let, let's go to the second row, Shere. Pastor, if you tell me one or two sentences, I don't think that I will be out. I will go over. I will go over. <laughs> Listen, all I can say is that I remember at my church, they had um, a very branch. He used to give um, myself and another young lady gifts every beginning of the year. And he was um, an older guy. In the church, and he used to give me out. Um, <laughs> he used to come, he used to the give me, give me beer mix in terms of giving out his sweet But at the end of the day, he came and gave me gifts. So I would have seen it would it would have been able to allow me to go at lunch. Um, after lunch, when he would be on the keyboard and sit down and listen to him and stuff like that, um, build better relationships with each other. That makes a big difference. Thank Amen. You, thank, you, thank, you. Uh, thank you. I, I want to say valuing each other. And as we when we value each other, we do not just value the person, but we value what the person has to say, how they think, their ideas, their opinions, as we work together. And, and that is that I, again I want to go back to Joel chapter 2, verse 28. That is what it's about. The young person's vision and the older person's dream may not from the outside look like they're in sync but according to God's way they are in sync. Let's work together uh, let's uh, empower each other and let's hasten the coming of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Um, I will close on this note. Um, one of my favorite passages of IG ministry is in Deuteronomy 29 where God makes a covenant with all the generations of Israel. Those who were in Egypt, those who were born in the wilderness, um, those who came as part of the mixed multitude, and even those who would come afterwards, those who were not present at the time God spoke. This tells me that God wants every generation, every um, class of persons in our church to be in a loving relationship with him. Let's work together to make sure that every generation is represented from the youngest to the oldest, and when Jesus comes, we will be part of that great number. May God continue to bless you as we work towards intergenerational ministry, as we examine and as we fulfill the mandates, the precepts, the principles of unit, you and I together. May God bless you. Thank you. God bless. Pastor Anthony Hall will now give us our Vesper thought for this evening. Let's listen as we find some tips to take us through the rest of this week. It is important for the church of God to realize that he desires unity among the brethren of the church. And especially as it relates to the nurturing of the young people in our congregations, it is anticipated that the best formula for raising young people, nurturing them, discipling them, maintaining their status in the church and seeing them grow and take their places in the work of God is to mentor them. Yes, to mentor them. A mentor is a person who takes a specific interest in the development of another person and supports and helps that person to grow in their Christian experience. Historically, in a writing referred to as Homer's Odyssey, the Greek warrior by name Odysseus leaves his wife and his young son Telemachus at home while he journeys to fight in what was called the Trojan War. To ensure that his son Telemachus is adequately cared for while Odysseus is away, he 
he appoints a teacher, a guide, a guardian, to tutor the boy, to teach the boy, to protect the boy, and to raise the boy in his absence. That teacher's name was Mentor. And hence, historically, we have developed the concept of mentoring young people. An adult person who comes alongside a young person holds their hand, sometimes literally, but symbolically and figuratively, and says to them, let me walk this journey of life with you. Mentor, therefore, performed that role for Telemachus. And in that regard, historically, we have come to the understanding that young people cannot really grow and mature as they ought unless experienced, loving, interested adults come alongside them and walk the journey of life with them. The word mentor then means someone who teaches or gives help and advice to a less experienced, often younger person. Now this means that if you're going to point the path, you need to know the way. The mentoring process is an intentional relationship where one person, the older person, encourages another to realize their fullest potential. It becomes important to realize that throughout history, we've had lots of mentoring relationships that are responsible for the success of many people who are now famous and who have done yeoman service in bringing cultured work and great success to the world stage and world economy. Uh, Socrates mentored Plato. Moses, in the Bible, the Hebrew deliverer from Egyptian slavery and bondage, mentored Joshua. Um, Aristotle is said to have been the mentor of Alexander the Great. And the Bible author Paul mentored several people, Barnabas, um, John, Mark, Silas, and Timothy, and spoke fondly of Timothy as his son. Julius Caesar, in Shakespeare's work, mentored Mark Anthony. And in the scripture for our focus at this time, I would like to mention that Jonathan, the son of King Saul, mentored David, the next king of Israel. What a contrasting pair they were. They were not the same. I would suggest to you that research indicates that at the time when David stoned Goliath and knocked him cold, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Lord, that David was no more than about 15 years old at the time of his anointing and at that episode where he encountered the giant Goliath. Saul was a man in his late 50s, about 58, 59 years old, so says the historical record. And Jonathan, his son, was a person who was in his 30s, his early 30s. So Jonathan was twice the age of David. David was a shepherd boy. Jonathan was a prince. It could easily be termed the story of the prince and the pauper. Jonathan had his own armor. David had, what, a harp, a slingshot, and some stones. Jonathan grew up in the palace and was trained in the art of war. But David grew up in the fields in a little town called Bethlehem, and he was trained to tend sheep. Jonathan, Jonathan sorry, was the eldest son and in line to inherit the throne after his father Saul. David was the youngest of eight boys and was anointed by Samuel to be the next king, yet this, in place of Jonathan. So one of the first things I would like to mention is that a mentor for a young person must be faithful to training and nurturing this young person with the full knowledge that the possibility exists, yea, that it is an expectation that that young person would take the place of the older person. Very often in life, older individuals, more experienced individuals, do not always wish to show their craft, their art, perform their nurture and training with younger persons because of a fear that that younger person will take their place, take their position, and take their acclaim or right to fame. Well, the truth is, Brothers and sisters, this is exactly what mentoring is all about. We do this training, nurturing, encouragement, and uplifting of young persons with the full knowledge that one day they will take our place. In fact, it is a purpose and an objective of mentoring young persons. 
in this context, therefore, Jonathan knew that David would be king of Israel. Now, by natural succession, Jonathan ought to have replaced his father. And I suppose and suppose only be normal if a person has a right to the throne of Israel that they would want to secure that right. But Jonathan did not regard that as being important. He had the Jesus mentality. Though being equal with God, he thought it's not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Jonathan nurtured David, knowing that the space on the throne, which was rightfully Jonathan's, was to be given to David because God had ordained it to be so. How beautiful it would be if an elder in the church would find a young person and train that person, that individual, knowing that one day that young man or young woman will take the reins of leadership and become the elder in their stead. Jonathan became a very close friend to David. And after the victory over Goliath is when he began to form and forge this friendship. Jonathan, the Bible tells us, made a covenant with David, an agreement, a pact. And his friendship was the most precious gift that David would ever receive in all of the scripture. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 57, and in chapter 18, verse 1, we are told, As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine Goliath, Abner took him and brought him before King Saul with David still holding the Philistine's head in his hand. After David had finished talking with King Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David. That's the role of a mentor, to become one in spirit with the young person. And he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan demonstrated loyalty to David despite the very advanced circumstances or adverse circumstances. Jonathan defended David before his own father. So many times Saul threw a javelin, a spear, at David to kill him. But Jonathan constantly defended him, even when King Saul, his father, told him, don't you know that this young boy intends to take your place on the throne? But Jonathan already knew that. The Spirit of God had revealed it to him. And nonetheless, Jonathan was there for David, defended him against his father, and asked his father actually to swear an oath that he will not bring any harm to the young boy. So great was the love they bear to one another. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1 to 4, we see how Jonathan gives over, demits, and hands over important articles of his life's experience and transfers them to David. The Bible says, And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off his robe, the robe which he was wearing, and he gave it to David, along with his tunic, and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. What this suggests to us is that Jonathan was transferring his implements of war, the implements of his craft, the tools of his trade. He was giving them to David, transferring his knowledge, transferring his tools, transferring his experience, transferring his ability, transferring his technique. This is exactly what a mentor does with a mentee. He gives him his garment. He gives him his robe. He gives him his tunic. He gives him his sword, and he gives him his belt. Symbolically, Jonathan was demitting the throne and saying to David, I know that the Lord has this in store for you. You can go ahead and have it. But more than this, David would require a number of skills as a man of war. He was raw in talent with a slingshot, but leading the armies of Israel would require him to know more, to do more, to be able to plan for battle. And Jonathan was a skilled warrior. When David himself became king of Israel, the skill that he wielded in leading the army into battle were things that he learned at the hands of his mentor, Jonathan. And therefore, God was using an older man to teach a younger boy how to fight this war of faith. Understand, brethren, today, that the young women and young men of our congregation, they need their parents, they need their aunts, their uncles, they need their teachers, they need a Sabbath school superintendent, they need their pastor, and they need their elders and others to transfer and transmit the values, 
the philosophy, the doctrine, the traditions, the leadership style of the church so that God's church can benefit from the transference of this knowledge. This is what mentoring is all about. We are told that Jonathan was committed to encouraging and helping his friend. When David was running for his life, Jonathan endangered himself by going to David and the scripture says, encouraged his hand in God. We see in 1 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 16, where the Bible de declares, And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in the Lord. What a beautiful text. What an exciting prospect for an older person to provide ministry for a younger person. The Bible says, Jonathan strengthened David in the Lord. Jonathan helped David to find strength in God. All of our pastors, all of our elders, all of our senior leaders in the church should be finding some young person to help them to become strong in the Lord. I know that I have benefited from these experiences and I want you to understand that it is a role of leaders to do the same. The scripture continues. In 1 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 17, the Bible says that Jonathan said to David, Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel. The man who by dynasty, by blood, is supposed to become the king of Israel is saying to somebody who is rivaling him, not because he intentionally wants to rival him, but because God has called him to ministry. Do not be afraid. My father shall not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Notice the older man is telling the younger man, I know that you're going to be in charge. I know that you're going to be a leader in God's church. I know that you're going to be king over Israel, and I am willing to be subject to your leadership. What a marvelous situation when older people in the church can allow the young people to lead. It does not mean that we do not have purpose or objectives, that we do not have initiatives of our own or leadership of our own. But what it does mean is that we accept a young person's ability and capacity and strength to lead. And we encourage them to do so with the full understanding that sometimes as senior leaders, we have got to follow as well. So Jonathan is a mentor to David. I will want to suggest to you today that for mentoring to take place, and be most effective, there must be trust. There must be loyalty, sacrificial love, and there must be no envy. For mentoring to take place, the key to making others a success is unconditional love, sacrificial investment, pouring your investment of time, ability, and interest into the life of a young person to see them grow and mature. It requires unselfish joy at another person's advancement. Be happy for the young people when they achieve things. Do not believe that they are taking your place and that you are being relinquished of something that you must hold on to. Many of the older persons in the church need to understand when it's time to give up and to move on and to support somebody else in the leadership. If you can only be active and feel important when you are the leader, then perhaps you need further strength from God. If you want to mentor, we must relinquish. If we want to grow somebody, we must know when to give up. We must give up the throne as Jonathan did to see another take our place and to carry on the work of God. To effectively mentor, we must be committed to being a friend to the young person. We must encourage the young person and help them even when it may cost us great things and put us at risk because we are doing it for the benefit of young persons. We need to be sensitive to key times of discouragement and crisis. And like Jonathan, encourage the young man, encourage the young man, the young woman, and lift them up in the presence of God. Well, Wayne Rice makes a peculiar comment about mentoring and declares this a new direction for youth ministry. He says, every young person needs at least one adult who is irrationally committed to their well-being. Millions of children grow up virtually alone, disconnected from adults, no love, no supervision, no positive role models. Yet these people must still find their way. They still grow up to become adults. Children can endure the most miserable conditions, he declares, 
even thrive in the midst of miserable conditions if they have at least one loving adult committed to their success. And this is what we're asking the church to do. The Bible speaks about it in Psalm 144 and verse 12. The scripture declares, Let our sons in their youth be as grown-up plants, and our daughters as corner pillars, fashioned for a palace. The King James Version says, fashioned after the similitude of a palace. This means that they must be shaped, discipled, and mentored by older, wiser, senior persons in the church. Older persons, young people need you. They need to be blessed by God through you. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, the apostle Paul is talking, and he says, treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. The relationship between the generations is something that is prescribed and promoted and encouraged by the Apostle Paul. He is declaring to us that young and old together must grow in order for the blessing of God's church to be realized. The importance of young people in scripture is extremely important. The Apostle Paul declares, let no man despise your youth. Don't ever be ignored. And the spirit of prophecy from Ellen White also supports the idea. Let not the youth be ignored. Let them share in the labors and responsibility. Let them feel that they are part of the act in helping and blessing others. Uh, the scripture also declares that the leaders of the church must find ways to support the young people. And Ellen White in pastoral ministry at page 275 also supports this clear idea. She says, very much has been lost to the cause of God because of inattention to young people. Ministers of the gospel should form a happy acquaintance with the youth of their congregations and should do their very best to help them to grow in Jesus Christ. We need mentors for our young people. We should seek to enter into their feeling, the feelings of the youth, sympathize with them in their joys and sorrows, their conflicts, their victories. Jesus did not remain in heaven when he chose to save us. He left the glories of heaven above and came to earth. Away from soaring and, 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 and sinful practices, Jesus did not stay away from us. He came down to this world that he might become acquainted with our weaknesses. And so he has experienced what we've experienced. And this we refer to in youth ministry as incarnational ministry, where older people become in the feelings and experiences of young people and help them to be able to mature and grow. It was Albert Einstein who penned the words and made them famous. I am standing on the shoulders of other men who have gone before me. Today, I want to leave you with this passage of scripture that motivates the youth ministry work, as you see in my logo here and now on your screen. Found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, which declares, Be ye followers. The Greek word there is mimitis, which means to imitate. Be ye followers of me, says the Apostle Paul, even as I also am a follower of Christ Jesus. So I follow. I follow senior leaders who are following Jesus. And I find and occupy my place through the demonstration of that. Brothers and sisters, I am who I am today because Anthony Hall was mentored in the ministry of God for the church. I will never forget Charles M. Greenwich, an old man in my congregation at Ebenezer when I grew up as a boy. Every Sunday, Charles Greenwich, the elder, would have me to come to his home to pick fruit, to help him in the garden, to pull weeds, to plant crops. And I go there every Sunday and help him with the land, help him with the coconuts, help him with the golden apples, the mangoes, whatever was in season. And as I picked the fruit, as I dug the soil, as I weeded the garden, he would spend time speaking to me about God's love, about the scripture, about the doctrine of the church, about the church manual, about the spirit of prophecy. And this went on for several years. Yes, indeed, several years. And after a while, I wondered why the old man, having so many children and grandchildren and, 
and, and so on, great grandchildren, would still invite me every Sunday to his home to be with him on his land and to help him with his produce. I got a little bit upset at times because I felt that he could have asked others, but he kept on asking me and I kept on going. And then on one occasion when I was about to graduate from high school and I was making a decision to become an attorney at law, I went to Father Greenwich as we effectually called him and I said, Father, I am thinking of becoming an attorney at law. He himself was involved in real estate and something of a solicitor. And as I told him my plan and my desire to become an attorney at law, he said to me, this is the conversation I've been waiting to have with you for all these years. The Lord has shown me that you are to be a minister of the gospel. It then dawned on me that I had been picking the mangoes and the golden apples, the coconuts, plowing the land, taking out the weeds and cultivating the soil, not because Father Greenwich really needed the assistance and the help, but because he wanted me in an environment where he could have spoken to me about the things of God, about the policies of the church, about the traditions of the church, and also about the doctrines of the church, where he could explain the word of God to me. And suddenly it became clear. The old man had selected me under the inspiration of God to be his mentee. And he, through sacrifice and the spending of time, had determined that he was going to be my mentor. When, in fact, I did arrive at Caribbean Union College, now University of the Southern Caribbean, I did not learn a whole lot about the doctrines of the church, about the policy of the church, about the church manual, about the prophecies of the church. I know I learned Hebrew and Greek, and perhaps some other things. But the point I'm making is, I was already equipped while climbing a coconut tree by an old man who poured his knowledge, his experience of the church, his leadership skills, his prophetic understanding, his spirit of prophecy explanations into my mind and into my heart and into my soul so that I could be equipped for the gospel ministry. Other persons like Pastor Fleming, Oriel Fleming, and several others poured into me, invested in me, and nurtured me for the position which I hold today. I thank God for all the persons who changed my life, who walked with me, who held my hand on this journey and led me to be the pastor, the minister, the youth leader that I am today. All the people in the church, mentor a young person today. Mentor a young woman, mentor a young man. Younger persons, submit to wisdom and the experience of the aged. And together, let us follow Christ Jesus. Older ones will want to say to younger ones, be followers of me even as I also am a follower of Christ. May God bless you as you be somebody to someone. We thank all of you for tuning in to our programs today. Truly, the success of UNIT could only be made possible through your support and your commitment to this initiative. We pray that your viewing has sparked interest and sparked a desire to make church a better place for everyone and to bring collaboration and unity between the older and younger generations. We thank everyone who would have helped to make UNIT possible. From our president, Pastor Hall, members of the UNIT committee for their contributions, um, the pastors and elders who would have made significant contributions to fleshing out the idea of UNIT, our AY leaders who would have also tuned in and offered their advice and support, and to the members of our conference who would have supported this initiative even to this present time. We say thank you for your commitment. We simply ask that you would make UNIT a matter of prayer and intentionality. Don't let this initiative fall by the wayside. We want every member every youth, every adult to be part of this in order to make church within the East Caribbean Conference and beyond a better place. So please give it your prayers, give it your support as we move unit forward. Allow me to pray with you as we close this evening session. Father, we give you thanks for all that has been accomplished today. Help us by your grace to work together with you 
to see UNIT become a living reality in every congregation. Thank you for your commitment to work with us, and may we be ever committed to you and each other. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. May God richly bless you.